Um, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Meg Maston. I'm the Chief Relationship Officer here at Copeace, and this is actually our eighth Coffee with Copeace. We started this when COVID hit, and um, it has been such a, a refreshing way to interact with people. Each, uh, each coffee, we've had uh, different guest speakers who have shared their professional, personal stories that have had an impact bent, whether it was organic farming or water conservation or um, just general financial pieces. So we've, we've really tried to cover the gamut. We're excited today to um, have Delisa O'Neilly with us, um, who's going to talk to us about the power of sport. And because it's the power of sport, I had to bring both my bears and my huskers to the table. So I think I'll wear half and half. Um, so anyway, just a few housekeeping things. This is very informal. We're going to go around um, with our team just to get a little quick update. And then we'll have Delise share her story with us. And then we'll open up for questions and answers. So please feel free um, to you know interact. And, and we want this to be uh, engaging for everyone on the call. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Hanan Levine, our Chief Financial Officer. He's going to just share our latest um, offering that's available to the public. So go for it, Hanan. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And, and uh, it's uh, great to see everybody this morning. Uh, I'm, like Meg said, I'm Hanan. For the ones of you who don't know, I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Kopi's. And I um, won't take too much time because you're not here to see me or hear me talk, even though I can talk a long time for those of you who know me. Um, I am excited to uh, keep uh, saying now that we've uh, we've launched already that we've on our we are uh, continuing and and walking the walk on the path of democratizing impact investment. Uh, we have launched our offering to WeFunder, basically making Copies an impact investing holding company that invests in companies that do good for the world uh, in private companies, right? So direct into startups, direct into companies that are a little bit more mature, um, opportunities that were not available for every investor. Uh, Copies has made it now available to every investment through our, through our WeFunder offering. Our minimum investment uh, threshold is $360. Um, really making it a, uh, a ability to make it a staple in your portfolio. Uh, I'd say Copies falls in the e-liquid funds aspect of your portfolio. It's a long-term investment, and we're excited to be able to offer that and, and provide that as an opportunity for, um, you know, the majority of the population now uh, to be able to participate in that wealth creation uh, in a positive way, you know, making money and, and doing good with your money, making, allowing uh, for uh, sub sub substantial growth in both uh, investment and uh, sustainability and impact. That's it. If you have any questions, feel free. There's investments available through uh, uh, check directly from your accounts, IRAs, credit cards, however you want to invest. It's a really friendly um, um, platform. And if, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or uh, any of the Copies team. Thanks, Hanan. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Ed Tepper. He's our chief operating officer based out of New Jersey. He's just going to share a little bit about how we've been surviving and even thriving a little bit during this challenging time. So take it away, Ed. Thanks, Meg, and welcome everyone. It's always so uh, heartwarming to see uh, all of you assembled every time we do one of these uh, uh, coffees with Copies. And uh, we're really grateful for you uh, taking a part of your day to be here with us today. Um, in terms of how we function uh, during uh, this uh, challenging time, it's been very interesting. I think we're very fortunate that we are organized as a virtual company, so we didn't have the learning curve that many businesses had to go through in terms of figuring out how to uh, conduct meetings like this virtually and how to interact with people in uh, different locations and still retain uh, you know, a personal nature to the interactions, which is so important for us in terms of everything we do and you know, how we touch each other in this environment. And uh, so that part has been great. The part that is always challenging uh, is uh, that things take a lot longer than you think they're going to take. Sometimes they cost more than you think they're going to cost. Um, you know, it's really a uh, time when uh, we have to challenge ourselves uh, to be better. And the way that we do that is we exercise patience, tolerance, and understanding, and we continue to try to be as good as we can be in terms of our communications with all of our stakeholders and uh, to effectively, you know, be um, transparent and open uh, 
as we continue to see opportunities develop. So from a functional standpoint, uh, we are functioning uh, at a very high level. Uh, we're very excited about the crowdfunding offering that's uh, currently underway and, uh, you know, very um, gratified and humbled by uh, the uh, response, which has been excellent thus far. But, um, you know, we continue to uh, push forward. We have the right tools and the right team in place to execute on our plan. And we'll continue to be uh, patient, tolerant, and understanding as we uh, continue navigating through this time. Well, well said. Thanks, Ed. Um, all right. I'll turn it over to you, our fearless leader, Craig Jonas. Go for it. Thanks, Meg. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, yeah, talking about uh, our team, it's, uh, you know, having gone through a lot of different uh, initiatives over time, and uh, it's all about the team. And we're honored to have one of our team members here today, uh, Delise O'Mealy. And we, you know, we like to have, we like to tell people that we've got an incredible extended team, but uh, Delise is uh, another level of, of special. So the timing of what's going on in the world and, and sports role is, uh, it's something that uh, we're we're excited about talking about a little bit today, and uh, and Delise is an expert in in that. Um, I've often said that you know people say sport mirrors society, and I think that um, sport has the opportunity to help dictate society. So so I uh, you know as Nelson Mandela said, sport has the power to change the world, um, and I, I I'm very excited to introduce uh, Delise here. Uh, uh, we at Co Peace have a very strong sport bent. We know that sport has the ability to uh, change the world and we're looking forward to harnessing that and we've got some news coming there that way as well. But I'm going to introduce Delise right now. I'm going to uh, put the uh, a link of her bio in the, uh, if that's all right with you Delise, in the in the Zoom for everybody to see. Uh, she is the, uh, her background is, is incredibly impressive. Not many people have an MBA and a, a law degree. She is the executive director of the Institute for Sport and Social Justice. Um, she's part of the FISU Executive Committee, which is like the Olymp uh, International Olympic Committee for uh, University Sport. Um, she was with the NCA for a long time, and she's been a champion of of, uh, of positive change with sport. So when you see, you know, mascots starting to uh, to change and some things that are going on in the world, Delise has been uh, instrumental in some of, uh, in some of the some of those efforts. So. Extremely excited about having Delise here. I'm going to paste her bio in so everybody can read it and turn it over to, Le to, to Delise. She can talk a little bit about some of her current activities and then we'll open up for question and answers. Great. Um, actually, Craig, give me just one second. Yes. All right, just let me adjust my camera. I like your shirt, by the way. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Bishop Tutu. Yeah, I don't, if anybody saw, you know, the WNBA and the NBA last night, uh, I think the, the power that sport has in our, our society was okay. um, Sorry. definitely echoed there. Yes, your turn. All right, sorry about that. So okay. um, thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. Hopefully everyone can hear me pretty well. It's good to be here with you all. You know, Co-Peace is doing such phenomenal work and just the energy and the positive spirit of this organization is really amazing. So as you heard from my introduction, I'm actually the CEO, uh, Craig, of the Institute uh, for Sport and Social Justice. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization based on the campus of University of Central Florida. We're nationally known for advocacy, research, and educational programming in this area. But we focus our efforts primarily within the sport world. So over the years, we've worked with all the major sport leagues, <clears throat> the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NFL, uh, Major League Soccer, NASCAR, the NCAA, as well as various colleges and universities. And we've even worked with all branches of the U.S. military and the Australian Army. So our theme is changing lives through the power of sport. And so you may say, well, what does that mean exactly? Well, we believe that sport is a great unifier. It's a great equalizer. We believe that on the playing field or, or on the court, all of our differences disappear. And when you play sport, the only thing that matters is if you have a good attitude and if you can play. So all the other things that then seem to separate us go away. So it doesn't matter then. It suddenly doesn't matter if you're 
African-American, if you're white, Latinx, Asian-American, Native American, it doesn't matter what your religion is. If you don't have a religion, it doesn't matter if you're young or old, if you're gay or straight, if, you're, if you come from a rich family or a poor family, you can't win unless you pull together. So we know that sport transcends barriers and boundaries in a way very few activities can. And we know that sport heals communities. So for example, everyone in America became a Yankees fan during the World Series after September 11, because it meant that New York could come back and everyone was happy and rejoiced when the Saints brought the Vince Lombardi trophy back to New Orleans in 2010 after Hurricane Katrina. And I've personally seen the power of sport erase, even if just for a moment, decades of animosity. So in 2013, Craig and I actually had an opportunity to take a team of student athletes to the World University Games in Kazan, Russia. And at the time, we were the first multi-sport American team to compete on Russian soil since the 1980s, since that boycott. And, you know, we're getting ready for the Parade of Nations and we're standing in line and we're not sure what's going to happen. So we tell all the students, you know, be prepared, be ready for any reaction. We'd been booed uh, previously in Serbia and we knew that the relationship was not good. So we said, you know, just hold your head up high, walk in, be proud as representatives of the United States. And as we entered that arena, we had 400 young people walking behind the American flag. There were over 60,000 Russians in that stadium. And we realized that they were cheering for us. They were on their feet, they were applauding, they were cheering as our college students made their way around the stadium. It was so impactful for all of us, for them. And I mean, for all of us, uh, especially those of us who were alive in the 1980s. So at the Institute, we take that concept and that openness and we use it as our platform to raise awareness, to teach leadership and life skills, to advocate for and to support social justice issues. So for 35 years, we've spoken out on racial and gender issues in sport and in our broader society. We've called out discrimination at all levels. We've advocated for change in hiring processes at the highest levels of sport. We've created award-winning programs that have focused on insidious gender bias, and we've raised awareness of gender-related violence. So in sport, the huddle is this powerful symbol of togetherness. It's this place where teammates come together, we challenge each other, we support each other, and we communicate our strategy. So based on this theme, our programming is called Huddle Up. And so our Huddle Up to End Gender Violence addresses the full continuum of abusive behaviors and empowers participants to understand how misogynistic language, sexual harassment, bullying, sexual assault, rape, domestic violence are all linked together. And then our Huddle Up for Leadership, Equity and Inclusion focuses on building community, building trust, embracing vulnerability as a leadership skill. And we introduce the topic of privilege in a way that invites participants to step into the conversation rather than to retreat. So we discuss power of language, the power of symbolism, unconscious bias, allyship, equality, equity, and we empower people to understand how bias, discrimination, stereotypes can create an unwelcome environment. So through these programs and many others, we've been a voice for positive change through the power of sport. Our experience, though, informs us that even though we've had some incremental progress, if you will, in sport, additional innovation is needed. And simply put, more needs to be done than what has been done in the past. And we've learned that, especially in this time frame, these conversations need to go deeper to shift attitudes and behaviors and to have more lasting impact on organizational culture. And we've learned that everyone has to be involved in the discussions about these issues. We've also learned that as a culture, we need to rethink how learning is defined. You know, in the past few months, we've seen really a change in our culture. After the George Floyd murder, we started to see this explosive reaction from the nation and, and really from, from the entire world. And there seemed to be a shift somehow, a tipping point as Malcolm Gladwell describes it. And the days and weeks that followed, they were filled with protest and civil unrest. Uh, we all had curfews, um, the National Guard was deployed. But for the first time in my lifetime, I saw humans of all stripes coming together, saying enough is enough. Corporations, sport organizations standing up and standing against oppression. You know, I can't really say why this happened this time. Maybe it was a perfect storm with this global pandemic that forced us inside, caused us to slow down and really observe what was happening around us. And it's a strange moment. It, it brings a sense of cautious optimism. There's a lot of anger out there still. Everyone now, though, is talking about systemic racism, 
people are talking about anti-racism and looking almost for the first time at the true history of this country and refusing to honor or celebrate symbols of hate. So I think from our organizational perspective, we're trying to recognize that we are at an inflection point. This is a period in our history that what we do right now will determine whether we have systemic change in our nation or we go back to business as usual and just wait for the next thing that happens. I think this moment demands that we work together to build community, to build trust, to have the strength and the courage to be vulnerable around these issues, to show up, to be seen, to understand how privilege and all kinds of privilege, race, gender, heterosexual privilege, religion, cis privilege, can sometimes blind those who have it and destroy those who don't. So I believe we have a responsibility to increase our knowledge exponentially, to understand our history and how it contributes to current social dynamics. So in response to this need, the Institute has created a plan for a nationwide co-curricular school-based social justice education. And our big vision around this is to ensure that every future American generation learns our complex social justice history. So for example, history of racism beginning with the arrival of the first slave ship in Virginia in 1619. Most Americans wouldn't be able to describe these kinds of historical markers, the Dred Scott decision or Plessy B. Ferguson, and importantly, how those events influence the trajectory of racial injustice in our nation's development. So we aim to provide what we're calling a through line for students to understand the connection between current social dynamics, the origin point, and then those important moments in between. And we're thinking our curriculum will include units that include power and privilege, talking about categories and why it matters, uh, a history of racism in the United States, understanding uh, a better understanding of our constitutional republic, um, systems theory as, and social order, um, this, this concept of our economic system, too big to fail, the economy from slavery cotton to the 2009 financial collapse and the direct link between those, as well as um, protests and resistance movements and more. So our goal is to create a coalition of sport organizations and public and private entities committed to positively impacting the nation and their communities through social justice education, and ultimately empowering our young people to be change makers, leading all of us to live our founding values of, of freedom, justice, and liberty for all. You know, the time has come for us to take a stand on April 4th, 1967, exactly one year before he was assassinated in Memphis, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke in a Riverside church in New York, and he gave an address entitled Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. And he led with this statement, a time comes when silence is betrayal. During the Holocaust, silence was betrayal. During the Rwandan genocide, silence was betrayal. And we know that if injustice is tolerated, it will never be stopped. So research tells us that every hour in the United States, someone commits a hate crime. And of the almost 8,000 hate crimes reported each year, 47% are racially motivated, 21% result from sexual orientation bias, 20% are motivated by religious bias, and 12% from ethnicity, uh, national origin bias. I'll stop, I'll, I'll stop here, but I'll end with one of my favorite quotes because it takes us it tells us really no matter who we are or what our sphere of influence might be, we can do something. It's from Robert F. Kennedy and it was taken from his 1966 Day of Affirmation speech in South Africa. Each time a person stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. That's where we are today. That's who we are, that's who we're trying to be. And actually I know that's who you are too. So it's great to just sit here and have this conversation with you. I'll stop here, Craig. I didn't talk much about myself. I'm happy to answer any questions about kind of my journey and, and what I have done uh, in this field. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and some of the exciting projects that we're working on. Uh, Delise, that was outstanding. I, you gave me goosebumps several times, and I and I, I really appreciate the, you know, your your the educational bent that the institute is is bringing to our world right now. I I, I agree with you. It does feel uh, like we're at a tipping point, and things are are a little different. I mean, uh, uh, and that's that's a hopeful sign. Uh, um, 
I, I do think if you don't mind uh, to talk a little bit about your, your background, I think we have some questions sure. uh, coming in already. I, I know we have one, uh, one athlete who's actually with us in, in Russia and, and uh, wow. just uh, privately said, I didn't realize how big a deal that was at the time, but it really was a, was big, a, deal. Was a big deal. Right. Um, yeah, I, I didn't mention that you were, sure. uh, through, you actually participated in international sport as a, as a tennis player on the, uh, uh, in the NCAA and on the Jamaican national team. Um, and so, yeah, I, if you don't mind just telling us a little bit about your background, um, that'd be great. Then we'll, we'll open it up for, for some more questions. Sure, absolutely. So I am an immigrant. I came to this country in 19, late 1980s. I'm originally from Montego Bay, Jamaica. And, um, you know, when I moved to here, I moved to New York City. And I'm going to share, I don't share this very often with, with folks, but it, it, it rings, it's significant for me because I come to a lot of my um, understandings as an immigrant with the knowledge that I, or the, the, the lens that I have as an immigrant. So when mm -hmm. I first came here to this country, I um, actually flew to Canada and spent a weekend up in Niagara, had a chance to see the Niagara Falls from the Canada side, visit some family and whatnot, and then down across the border to get down to New York City where my uncle, uh, my aunt were living, where I was going to be staying. And um, at the border in, at the Buffalo Crossing, I was, we were taken out of our cars and we were separated, my uncle and me. I was late teens, maybe 19, and my rights were read to me. I didn't even know at the time what the Miranda rights were, but I remember very clearly, um, anything you say can and will be held, uh, used against you. And they kept me for about 45 minutes and then they subjected me to a body cavity um, strip search an unfounded strip search, looking for drugs or whatever the case may be. And that experience never left me. Uh, it's been you know, more than 30 years now. And I, um, I remember what that felt like. And I remember you know, what I felt like. And so it reminds me when I see immigrant issues and, and the conversations around immigrants in this time, it reminds me how far uh, we have to go as it relates to you know, human rights, for, basic human rights for everyone. So I, I moved to New York. I'm a tennis player, as Craig said. I went down to uh, Maryland to go to school, had an opportunity to get a tennis scholarship, uh, played college tennis there, and started my career in college sports. I moved out to the NCA back in 1997 when they were originally in Kansas City and started kind of in the legislative uh, compliance related area. I was one of the people that if you picked up the phone to ask a question about NCA rules, you might have got you might have got me on the phone. Uh, moved up at the NCA, um, oversaw that area for a bit, and then needed a chance to do something different. So I moved into the policy side at the NCA, working with governance. So essentially advancing policy through the NCA structure. And I did that for, oh, 11 years. And uh, some of the main policies or major policies around the diversity inclusion space that I was involved with include the Confederate flag policy back in 2001, 20 years ago. The NCA took a stand on the Confederate flag policy. And as you see, this past a few months when NASCAR eliminated the flag from their racetracks and then the SEC later took a decision. And now we finally seen the last bastion fall, which was Mississippi are removing mm -hmm. that flag from you know, its, um, its, its state flag. And uh, we also worked with the Native American mascot policy in 2005. And that was a tough, tough time. I mean, the nation really wasn't ready to talk about this. They wanted to play their sports, they wanted to have their mascots, and they didn't think the NCA should be involved in this at all. So we were abused, we got death threats. We, um, uh, NCA president at the time, Miles Brand started to, he had a security detail assigned to him at the time because of the, the, the comments we were getting. And it was around mascots, you know, it was around sport figures. And people were saying, we want our mascots, we honor Native Americans and all these kinds of things, while the Native American community was very quietly saying, no, you do not. This is not honorific for us. And this, is, this does not represent who we are, who, how we want to be seen. So it was really um, rewarding for me to see, finally, after, now that's 15 years of doing this work, wow. that the Washington team, really, the Washington team Washington, finally yeah. is taking a stand. That would be the last ever expected. So, you know, it's been rewarding to, to some extent, although it's been a protracted time period. Uh, mm -hmm. While I was at the NCA, I started doing some international work, which really is a passion for me because I'm an interna I was an international student athlete. And so the first project I worked on was opening NCA membership to Canadian schools. It was a pilot program. 
and we were successful uh, in bringing Simon Fraser from um, uh, the Vancouver area into the NCA Division II. It was a long process again because people were saying, oh, it's national. National means national. Now, mm -hmm. Forgetting that, you know, baseball has a World Series and, you know, all these other things. So after I, I did that, I just, uh, you know, the, the group that I mentioned earlier, the, the U.S. Federation, came before the executive committee. I was working with the executive committee at the time, talking about these World University Games, and they were looking for some funding support. And I remember playing in those games. I said, wait a minute. Yeah, I, I was at that event, you know, in 1993 as a student athlete. Hands down, the most um, impressive experience that I've had in my lifetime as a student athlete. And I got involved. I said, I have to work with this organization. There's no, no way around it. And so I did. And I think the rest is history. I've been working in the international field kind of alongside the other work that I do for now 12 years, it seems. And had the opportunity last year in Torino, Italy to be elected to the FISO Executive Committee, which is a huge honor. Um, I, the US, USA has not had a seat on that committee for eight years. And prior to that, the person who was in that position was actually the president and someone that some of you may well know, a very close friend of, of Craig's, uh, George Killian, who passed away a few years ago. And so for me, it was an interesting and very political process to work my way through that system as first US to get back in as a woman and as a woman of color. And so it was um, really a two year campaign for me to get to where it, it happened, where, where I was elected. I was proud to um, achieve the, I think I got the sixth highest number of votes in my section. And um, I, I think, you know, just looking forward to the opportunity to using this platform to continue this kind of work because this is where my passion lies. So. That, I think that covers it, Craig. I have twin that's daughters. Great. They're 15 yep. here driving me nuts. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's my story. <laughs> that's a, well, so thank you for sharing. I, yeah, you, you shared more than I had known before. So it was very nice of you to, to share. I, I, uh, I, if, before I open up for everybody else, I know I'm, I'm getting some uh, comments. Uh, the, um, tell us a little bit about, the, I, I'm not sure how you want to, would categorize this, but the momentum that the Nike ad that was posted last night, which was incredible, uh, the WNBA, the NBA, and and kind of the uh, I, I, the momentum and the courage that that feels like is happening. That that and, and how does that how does the institute kind of coordinate some of that or work together with uh, with those those leads and their messages? Yeah, it's a, a very interesting and unique time, Craig. There is a huge kind of wind behind us right now the the, mm -hmm. the challenge is we don't know how long it will last we hope it will mm -hmm. last and we hope that we will finally get to a place where we actually see some systemic change so that nike ad i don't know if you all have seen it but here's why it was amazing for me it did several things it united male and female sports so i, I don't if you haven't seen it it'll be a little difficult for me to explain it because I'll, they have I'll a post split it. we'll screen. post it here yeah yeah okay so there's this split screen and you'll have one team or you know athlete on this one side and another on another team or athlete on the other side and they've synchronized it so that they seem to be moving in tandem but the message that you get from that is we we all are working together and we're going to accomplish this we're united there's a unity and then there is this athleticism that you see from both the male and the female side and you see it clearly so the, it erases the distinction between male and female athletes, in my opinion, about mm -hmm. who's really an athlete and who's not an athlete. They're all kind of there together. You know, Nike has done some good work um, in the last few years. You know, they've taken some very, fairly difficult stands. Uh, it's worked out for them, I think, financially, which is great. But they've been at the forefront of trying to, um, you know, raise or raise the awareness on some of these things. If you have a chance to look at that ad, please do, because I think it's very powerful. Um, yeah. The NBA, WNBA, as you've seen, have made statements with what they're doing on court. We work a lot with the NBA. We have uh, very close relations with Kathy Behrens, who is their president of social responsibility. And, you know, she's a visionary and she pushes the envelope. Adam Silver also pushes the envelope. I think it's probably fair to say that if people ask, you know, what organization is doing it right, at this point, people would likely point to the NBA, not saying they're perfect but that they're out there trying to do things. So mm -hmm. I think the power of the, the unity in the movement is what's continuing to fuel us and to help us move forward. Now at our level, what has happened is 
people have started to ask questions. They want mm -hmm. to learn more. They're engaging. Um, and that's wonderful because that's what we want to do. We want to talk. We want to have as many conversations across this nation as we possibly can, because that's how you start to get people to, yeah. to open their minds and, you know, see other people as people and, and understand the circumstances that put us in the situations that, that we are in. So it's, a, it's an interesting and a good time right now. And we're hopeful that we can continue this path and get us to a place that we can, you know, there's a, a really cool quote. I just saw it and I can't repeat it because it's, I don't remember it exactly, but it was from John Lewis. Um, he, he wrote this piece to be published after his death. And it said something about this, your generation being the one that can finally put to rest hate and, you know, violence and all of these things. And, and that's what we, we hope. Can we yeah. be that generation that can finally put that to rest? Yeah, well, in, in, in uh, I just wrote a, a blog where my 22-year-old uh, allowed me to quote him where he said that a lot of our problems are because of, of, uh, of uh, your generation, Dad, but we're going to make it better, you know, something like that. So <laughs> I, there's, some, there's got definitely some it's hope good. going on. Um, I hope uh, Meg so. posted the uh, Nike ad. Um, let's, uh, let's open it up for others. Uh, mm -hmm. I, the... Um, it, where where are you on that curriculum process? Is that is that uh, something that continues to get refined, or is that starting to get out there? Well, we we just started building it. We built it okay. in response to the crisis, and oh, we're nice. looking for help. You know, we're looking for support. We're talking to organizations, trying to find funding to help us um, get it out there. We we already have worked on some distribution channels um, to get it into the school systems, but nice. we need help. Thanks. Well, that maybe some of us here can be part of that process. Uh, Tammy, thank you for uh, linking that uh, John Lewis quote that uh, Delise was just talking to. I'm gonna send, give it back to you, Meg, to open it up sure. for others. Yeah, I'd love to just uh, let anyone in the audience um, ask questions to Delise and uh, or share a story or whatnot. So uh, anybody, feel free, jump in. I spearhead. I feel bad as a as a co-peace team member, but I have a question. Go for it. I was just wondering Go for it. If, about your comments or thoughts, Delise, around <clears throat> you know before the NBA season got restarted, uh, Kyrie Irving was one of the people who came out and he said, you know, should we really be playing sports right now? Is it going to detract from everything that's going on, or is it just going to send everybody back into their homes to watch sports again? Um, and just that balance of making it an authentic learning and educational opportunity for people and not just, you know, uh, putting Black Lives Matter on the court and being done with it sort of thing. Um, I think that's been a big point, like a lot of players struggle with, you know, they want to be effective in what they're trying to do and trying to balance that with just playing the game, quote unquote, you know, what that's like. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think Le LeBron James statement um, when he said he wasn't going to do this because that's really not his focus. I think that kind of points to what you're saying. You know, what exactly are we doing? How are we moving forward? People miss their sports. So I know that people are happy to have, you know, the NBA back to watch something, but you're right. We have to figure out how we continue uh, this movement. It, it's more than just the awareness. It's more than just this shirt that I'm wearing that maybe you read it and you say, oh yeah, that makes complete sense. And then you go on off about your day. We have to be able to find ways to engage. So I think you know, we're working and I know many other social justice organizations are busy working now trying to really hold on to this moment and to create a, a momentum that we actually haven't seen in 20, 30 years of moving things forward. I, I want to point to a couple of things um, that I thought was interesting. So the Native American mascot piece, that happened as a result of this movement. And people will say, well, you know, it's not quite the same. But what happens when people stop and listen and they open their minds, then they start to see other injustices. They start to see other areas that, you know, people are oppressed. And that was one of the, the beautiful things because there's no zero sum game here. We're all trying to make sure that everyone's, you know, that there's equity in this world. And so your question, Jim, I mean, it's, it's a good one. And I'd be interested in, in comments from others as to what they think about the moment and sport coming back and whether it's helping or hurting this, this moment. Other questions? Yeah, I, I, from my perspective, I think it's definitely helping. I'm just watching my, you know, I have a 26 year old and a 22 year old and it feels like it just uh, continues to, uh, 
um, you know, bring home some of the messaging that is, is affecting real change. I, I, lo I love your point about, uh, you know, kind of when, when this change happens, the other, you know, things that are the oppression that's going on kind of percolates up and that, you know, that uh, we're, we're, we're you know, the, the movement is getting seized by, by, by many fronts. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a positive, but that's just my perspective. I shouldn't dominate here. Yes, let's open it up, sorry. I would, um, I have a comment, I guess, Delise, my name's Tammy Crawford. I'm actually Jim's mom, um, Hi, but Jim. I am a professor in sport management at Washington State, and I teach a, a sport and diversity class and uh, using sport as a platform to teach diversity. Basically, everything that you were talking about, I'm just like, oh my gosh, yes, exactly, exactly, right? Um, and I probably touch about 1,100 students a year. Um, they're big, big lecture classes. And um, I, I remember the, the video, the um, Kaepernick video, right? Where the, I think actually Jim sent it to me and it showed, it was an advertisement and it showed the demographics of what people's reaction were with a whole bunch of video clips Kaepernick and Serena and LeBron and and it was it as you watch that and then they broke it down by um, politics and they broke it down by um, I don't think they did it by gender but certainly by age and so it was a great visual for the students to watch these different generations react just to the images on the screen and when Serena comes on there the older generation just tanks you know what the, what is it a positive image when lebron comes on there it tanks when um a, you know an immigrant comes on it or a soccer player an international soccer player or it's and then they show you know a, 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 a caucasian person and it starts to climb again and and it's really interesting because there is a generational divide um and i do really try to reinforce the fact that they are a they, they are a generation that can make a difference. And I think that we're, that we're seeing that. Yet there is a portion of students just because of the environments that they've grown up in that are, you know, they, they don't see privilege or they, they don't understand it. So I, I'm really excited about this movement and using sport to open their eyes because sport really is a unifier, I think, and people will pause and listen. And so it's, it's pretty exciting. So I don't really have anything to say other than I'm really excited to hear you. I reinforce um, the things that you're saying with my students, but it's, it is difficult to um, get some students to open their eyes. Um, yeah. And then others just really want to make a change and they aren't quite sure how to. So it's definitely yeah. a balance, but it's, it is exciting time. So thank you for sharing your words today. Thank you. Um, if Jim, if you wouldn't mind sharing that link with me, I would love to see that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's so interesting, Tammy, because we're balancing also, you know, you have some people that are feeling like what's happening around me. I'm in quicksand. What on earth? The world is changing. And then there are other people sitting right beside them saying, you're moving so slowly. Why aren't you moving fast enough? It's, it's a very unique dynamic. Thank you, Tammy. Other questions or comments? I have a question, but I'm Kopis yeah. again. So I want to let other people, if somebody else wants to have, like, uh, Delise, first of all, thank you so much for sharing all your stories. And, and, and you know, as an international student athlete, um, I didn't go through nearly the horrible experience that you've had, but I've had numerous encounters, um, even being, a, a, you know, a white man, um, encounters uh, with uh, immigration officers that have, uh, I've been in that, been put, put away in the small room for several hours, um, uh, comments about that I'm taking uh, US, uh, uh, good US students places in the university. So again, not even comparing, I'm not even trying, but just, just to let you know, you know I understand, especially, um, you know, that point of view. Uh, um, I have a question. I think you mentioned Nike and Kaepernick come up a lot in this conversation. And I think it's interesting because just like an impact you know, what I see the change is going to happen truly when institutional money comes behind it, right? When an athlete, mm -hmm. with, a, with a black athlete especially, can come out and say, Black Lives Matter, or here's my opinion, and he's not dropped by all of the sponsors immediately right. after that comment. So, and I think a lot of people uh, ignore that side of oppression of super athletes, of, of athletes in general, right? They think, 
well, they make millions of dollars, they can do whatever they want. But really, I think until now, they couldn't say whatever they wanted to say or say their opinion without that fear in the back of their mind of getting the backlash that Kaepernick did get and Nike went on the, the side. But my question to you is, uh, not that it's easy, but it's almost easier for Nike to be the person going out and supporting athletes, right? Because that's their kind of world they're in. Are you seeing non-traditional institutions uh, now come into play with dollars? Because that's, again, what's going to change. Are you seeing that happening or are we not there yet from your perspective? We'd love to hear with your organization being a part of that because, you know, I think that's really when we see the change. But we'd love to hear your opinion about that. Sure. And you're absolutely right. When the money got behind it, that's when you started to see a lot of change. Uh, right after the, the incident happened, several, lots of companies came out with pledges and non-traditional. Um, uh, I, I shouldn't say non-traditional because some of them have been doing work in social justice, but not necessarily social justice and sports. So we weren't necessarily tied to them. But, you know, all the tech companies came out, all the social media companies came out. Um, Nike, of course, came out and the Jordan brand came out and, um, you know, Microsoft and all of these others. So I think that there's, there continues to be um, uh, dollars being put towards this, which was very interesting because, of course, we're still in COVID time. And, you know, two weeks before the George Floyd issue, no one had money and people were laying off and furloughing people. And, you know, I guess your perspective shifted, perspectives shifted a bit which is good in a sense. So yeah, the dollars are, are out there now, I think. It, whether it'll be sustained, we'll see. Um, the NFL promised uh, 200 million over, a, I think it's 200 million, it's a crazy amount, over like a 10 year period or something like that. And so there are organizations that have pledged to at least give these dollars or support these programs for a period of time. And we're hopeful that that will help. Uh, the Institute, we're trying to get funding also. So we've been, you know, trying to connect and trying to engage with entities to find out what criteria um, they're offering. Sometimes they've just put out a pledge and we can't, haven't been able to find, okay, what exactly are you doing with the money? How can we access that? How can we use it in the community to do what we do? So we're still working, working on that. Your, your piece on um, athletes is right on point. I did a, a keynote at the University of Georgia a couple of years ago around athlete activism. And it was entirely athlete activism in the era of social media. And it was playing off of that LeBron James issue when that sportcaster told him to shut up and dribble. Mm -hmm. And his reaction, of course, was we will not shut up and dribble. And then this whole hashtag and everything that happened after that. And, it, and I went through the history of athlete activism. And if you go back to the 60s, when athletes spoke up, a lot of times their careers ended unless they were really super athletes. So if you look at... Um, uh, the, the, um, he, the Muhammad Ali, for example, you know, he stood up for his beliefs and he struggled. Lots of people don't know exactly how bad it was for him because he was able to come back and then he ended his life as honored and revered by, by all of us. John Carlos, um, you know, when they raised their fists in 1968, they lost everything. They weren't able to get any endorsements, nothing. And, you know, they just had, they, they lost all opportunity. And there are many others like that. So what we've seen now, though, is the kind of an independence that's being created by some of the really elite athletes, the really top, like LeBron and, and those who can withstand um, the negativity. And they're taking a stand, but you're also starting to see other athletes doing it also because of what you said, because the organizations are now standing behind them. And you're even starting to see student athletes taking a stand on college and university campuses, recognizing the power of their voices and saying, you know, we need change. And if we don't get change, we're not gonna play. Excellent, thanks, Delise. That was a great answer. Um, I think we'll take another question or two before we sign off. So let's see, Brendan Morrison, I think you raised your hand, go for it. Uh, yeah, um, nice to meet you and everyone. Uh, I kind of had a question, uh, you're talking about uh, Washington and everything's gone on there. Um, I'm actually, uh, so my dad's side of the family is Native American and uh, I was one, you know, my whole life been uh, screaming about Washington using a racial slur as a nickname and it, it, there's kind of been, 
I mean, honestly, in the last month, just this uh, wild amount of stuff that's really happened in the Indigenous community. Um, uh, with uh, McGirt v. Oklahoma, uh, Washington changing its name now. Uh, Cleveland is even considering a uh, change their name. And there, there, there seems to be this weird, uh, well, not weird, but encouraging uh, explosion of just indigenous awareness. Um, I, I'm kind of wondering how that would uh, relate to the other sports teams and uh, and kind of the nuance of that because I, I would always talk uh, with my friends stuff about Washington was was fairly obvious because they they were using a racial slur um, right. their, their team and I always compare them with like the Kansas City Chiefs where you know chief isn't necessarily or isn't a racial slur it's not uh, necessarily but you know showing up to a stadium with a fake war bonnet and and, uh, and jumping around pretending to do a war dance I mean obviously that's fine so I guess how do you see uh you know kind of explaining that nuance in, in uh the Native American uh, mascot name because I always hear that argument of you know well that that one's not like, you know Washington was obvious but you know Cleveland Indians uh for example well, the name isn't necessarily offensive the mascot was so we'll, we'll get rid of the mascot but you still have people in the stands uh, dressing up like that and, and doing yeah. all the red face and all that kind of stuff. And um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, how you see that uh, moving forward with uh, uh, trying to explain that to people. Yeah, that's um, it's a great question. I'm hoping, honestly, uh, Brandon, that it will change, that it will start where it started and then continue down. When the NCAA took a look at this issue in 2005, um, we took a stance that, you know, we didn't have any names like the Washington team that we were looking at. What we, what, the, the, what existed in, in the college space was team names, tribe names, Indians, Braves, tribes, those types of names. And so we took a stand that all of it should go. And that if you um, represent a people in this manner, then you are dehumanizing those people and you are taking away from them the opportunity to be seen for the full um, uh, extent of who they are. They're not just this, what you're portraying. And because the Native American population was so small, we pointed out that the likelihood that you actually know someone who is Native American, who has Native American roots, you may not know that. And so you may not recognize that this person right beside you is Native American and, and have the ability then understand that you know there are people just like you every you know doing different things with the same struggles and challenges and so we made the point of saying none of it was right that it all needed to go what happened for us though is that there were some there was some um uh, difference of opinion inside the native american Enough. community obviously the tribes are um you know all of the tribes are autonomous and so for example, Florida State was the first one um, that the Seminole Nation in Florida spoke up and said, well, we'll support them. And that was after we'd already put them on a list of, you know, that they needed to do something. And so after that one, we had maybe four or five mm -hmm. others that were tribe mm -hmm. name specific. But we took the position that Indians had to go because you can't defend Indians. You, you should not be representing your team as Indians. And there's no tribe that can say, yes, you can use Indians. Um, we didn't like Braves either, although there are a couple of schools that still carry that name, but what they did was remove all native imagery or anything that would then draw the name Braves to the Native American community, even though it started there. That was a compromise, probably not the best, um, best outcome, but it was a compromise. And then um, tribes, I think was another one. And so we asked them to get rid of all of the imagery. Nothing that you're doing should point to the Native American community. And I believe that, you know, for the chiefs and those that it should go that same way. That if they, you know, I don't know how chiefs, you know, I, I don't know how you make the argument that that's not tied to the Native American community. Um, but at the very least should remove all imagery and, and paraphernalia and the things that, and the, the dances and the things that they do that tie to the Native American community. Um, community. Thank you, Delise. Um, I think we're going to wrap things up. I want to uh, thank all of our guests 
on the call. We're, um, and particularly thank you, Delise, for sharing your morning with us and your, your personal stories and professional expertise on this very important issue. I think it's um, inspiring, motivating, and lets us know we've still got a lot of work to do at the same time, but thank you so much. We are gonna plan to do another Coffee with Copi the last Friday of August, which is the 28th. Um, so keep an eye out for that. We will announce our guest speaker as it approaches a little bit closer, but um, wishing everyone good health, wellness, safety, thinking of all of you and your families. Um, and uh, thanks again for coming to us for coffee today. Appreciate it. <laughs>